Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's panel discussion, the concluding event of the Caesar exhibit uh, inside Syria's secret prisons. My name is Golbag Rekaptalai, and I'm a professor in the Department of History and also the co-director of the Middle Eastern and North African Studies here at Seton Hall. On behalf of the organizers of Caesar Exhibit, the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and the co-sponsors of the uh, panel discussion, the Provost's Office, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Dean's Office, um, the English Department, Middle Eastern and North African Studies Program, History Department, and Scholars for Syria, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, before I forget, I just need to make a quick announcement uh, for students who are joining us tonight. There are two sign-in sheets in the back. Uh, one is for COVID-19 tracking and one is for extra credits. So please make sure that you sign the appropriate uh, sheet. <laughs> so as you know, this week Seton Hall has had the honor of displaying some of the photos that are part of a collection known as the Caesar file that were smuggled out of Syria and that attest to the atrocities of the Syrian regime and it's especially its prisons uh, and torture systems. <laughs> Tonight's panel on this same topic promises to be a very thought-provoking conversation. And to begin this conversation, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speakers. Uh, I think I'm going to start uh, uh, the introductions with uh, Moaz Mustafa, uh, the driving force uh, behind this project. Moaz Mustafa is executive director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force. He was born and raised in Damascus, Syria, before moving to the U.S. as a teenager. As former staffer for Congressman Vic Snyder and Senator Blanche Lincoln, Moaz spent a few years on Capitol Hill before join, joining the Syrian Emergency Task Force in the fall of 2011 to help, to help advocate on behalf of the pro-democracy movement in his native Syria. Since the start of the Syrian revolution, he has worked uh, the back rooms of Washington trying to bring this cause to the forefront of political discourse. Moaz continues to advocate on behalf of the pro-democratic movement inside of Syria, uh, working with his expansive network of activists, opposition figures, and free Syrian army soldiers. Moaz and Syrian Emergency Task Force provide aid to millions of Syrians in need of humanitarian assistance and are working to build a system of civilian councils to help with transitional governance inside Syria. Our next uh, speaker uh, is Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who is the former US Ambassador for War Crimes Office of Global Justice, appointed by President Obama. Currently advisor to the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and roaming representative of the Center for the Prevention of Genocide and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. He is focused on building prosecution efforts against war criminals in Syria. From 2009 to 2015, Ambassador Rapp was U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice in the U.S. State Department. In that position, he coordinated U.S. government support for international criminal tribunals, as well as to hybrid and national courts responsible for prosecuting persons charged with genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. During his tenure, he traveled to 87 countries to engage with victims, civil society organizations, investigators and prosecutors, and the leaders of governments and international bodies to further efforts to bring the perpetrators of mass atrocities to justice. During 2017-2018, he was also the Father Drennan uh, Visiting Professor for Human Rights at Georgetown. He serves as chair of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability that has collected 
and analyzed more than 750,000 pages of documentation from Syria and Iraq to prepare cases for future prosecution. Our next speaker, Omar al shoghri is a former detainee in the Assad regime's brutal prisons inside Syria. At the age of 15, Omar was first arrested at a protest. By 17, he had been arrested for the seventh time and spent three horrific years in the worst of Syria's prisons, including nearly two years in Syrian intelligence agency branch 215, where he was responsible for numbering dead bodies that later appeared as photos in the Caesar file. While in Branch 215, Omar learned that most of his family and village were killed in the brutal Banias massacre, one of the most horrific massacres of the war. After Branch 215, Omar was moved to Saitnaya, Saitnaya prison, dubbed the worst place on earth, where he survived for a year before finally being released. Along with his surviving 10-year-old brother, Omar eventually traveled to Sweden, uh, learned Swedish, Norwegian, and English, and worked for one year with the Boston Consulting Group. Today, he's a member of the Caesar team and the Syrian Emergency Task Force and is currently studying at Georgetown University in DC. As a public speaker, and he's a good one at that, as a public speaker and advocate, Omar has given TED Talks, met with the White House, United States Holocaust Museum, members of Congress, the New York Times, Washington Post, and many other venues. He's also a key witness in several ongoing European court cases against the Assad regime. Alongside Caesar, Omar will be a key witness in future U.S. prosecution efforts to hold the Assad regime accountable for its detainments and executions of American citizens. Next speaker, Qutayba Idlibi, earned his bachelor's in political science from Columbia University and is the representative of the Syrian opposition coalition to the United States. He is also a Syria Fellow at the International Center for Transitional Justice, researching the framework of political imprisonment in Syria and a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, researching economic sanctions and forced displacement. His past experience includes profiling refugee entrepreneurship in Turkey and Jordan, Jordan with building markets, analyzing security policy in Turkey and Syria at the Global Policy Institute, and developing governance and security atmospheric rep reports for the U.S. Joint Special Operations Command and the USAID Office of Transitional Initiatives. <coughs> He's a 2013 Leaders for Democracy Fellow with the U.S. Middle East Partnership Initiative at the U.S. Department of State and a 2016 Peace Exchange Fellow with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Boteba currently serves as a board member of Paper Airplanes, Abjad Initiative for Education, and Tastaghel Women's Center, where he advances accelerated education, skills training, and women's empowerment across refugee communities in the Middle East. And our last but not least speaker and the moderator of the panel, Deborah Amos is an award-winning international correspondent for National Public Radio. Her reporting on the Middle East and refugees in the U.S. is regularly featured on NPR's Morning Edition, Weekend Edition, and All Things Considered. She has recently covered the Syrian and Iraqi refugee crises, the economy in the Middle East, and the Arab youth surge. She previously reported for ABC's Nightline and PBS's Frontline. Amos is the author of two books, Eclipse of the Sunnis, Power, Exile, and Upheaval in the Middle East, and Lines in the Sand, Desert Storm, and the Remaking of the Arab World. She has won several major journalism honors, 
including a Courage in Journalism Award from the International Women's Media Foundation, a George Foster Peabody Award, an Edward R. Morrow Lifetime Achievement Award, and an Emmy. She's currently Ferris Professor at Princeton, where she teaches journalism during the fall term. Now, before we invite our guests to speak today, we are going to play a short video clip for you, which basically provides a brief background on the activities of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and also provides a short background on the Syrian revolution and the civil war that followed it. Uh, the video, clip you're, the video clip you're about to watch has some very graphic images with references to violence and torture that are potentially disturbing. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that so that you can consider it as a trigger warning. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to watch the clip now. Hi, I'm Emma Chang, and my wife and I, we have a foundation, and we support leaders from around the world. And my wife went to uh, the Holocaust Museum, and she came back and said, hey, I want to support this leader. His name is Muaz Mustafa, and he runs an organization called the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and they do work in Syria. And she started to tell me what they do, and I said, wait, I I'm, I'm hesitant about Syria. I don't know if our foundation should get involved in it. That seems like a really messy thing. And I was reacting to something. I was reacting to a narrative that had been told to me over and over again, and I didn't realize it. It was a narrative that there was a civil war going on in Syria that was so messy and so violent and so entrenched, there was no way that you could get involved in that area. But I just realized that I was being told a story by somebody. Who was that somebody? Now here's the thing, I make movies, and we try very hard to pull the storyline out that is the most connected to the audience, the thing that will make you come to the movie theaters. That's the story we try to pull out and tell you and say, hey, this is the movie, this is the story, and then you feel connected to that story and then you come to the movie. Well, in this case, the person telling the story wants just the opposite. They don't want you to come. They don't want you to get involved. So the person telling me the story of Syria is telling me a story so that I have that reaction, so that I don't want to get involved. And the person telling the story is Assad. And he's telling me the story of this violent, messy civil war that I should stay away from. But really, after learning what's actually happening in Syria, I realized there's an actual amazing story underneath it all that I'm very, very connected to. And this is the story I want to talk to you about. It was children that start this story. These children, inspired by us, inspired by America, went and spray painted on a wall the words freedom and your turn's next, doctor, referring to Assad. They were arrested. These children were tortured and more protests rose and more children protested. The country as a whole started to rise up. You had one city, then another, and then another, and they faced the military with flowers, and it was peaceful protests for as long as they could go. <laughs> Our opinion was turning against Assad. So much so, it was inevitable it was going to end with the toppling of the dictator, and that's where it should have ended. Assad started telling his story. To avoid the narrative of a group of families and children fighting for freedom, 
to not get to us, to not get to the world, he immediately painted them as Muslim radicals and began the story of the civil war in Syria because eventually he would have been toppled and things could have worked out in the way that it should have if Russia hadn't gotten involved and Iran hadn't gotten involved. Both of them got involved for their own reasons. None of them good. Then ISIS sees a vacuum in all of this mess and decides to come into Syria. And Assad loves this. He loves this because now he can tell the Western world he's fighting our enemy. And that creates even more confusion in the mix. And so this story of this messy civil war is now entrenched and the world steps away. Atrocities are happening on a scale we can't imagine and people are getting slaughtered. Here we are, 10 years later, and how did this never again moment happen? How is it still going on? Well, it's because of the story that we were told. We shouldn't forget about the real story, about children fighting for freedom. Children have disappeared. I had gotten a chance to spend time with Caesar, who was a police photographer who took all the photos of, took 50,000 photos of victims of Assad's torture and brought them out of the country to show the world. And as I sat here, he actually showed it to me in this room. I was chilled and moved and I felt very much connected to those kids, that their story was my story. The story of my dad coming to America here to start a new life, to dream about freedom uh, for himself and his family, that they were dreaming the same dreams. Uh, those kids could be me. Um, they actually even looked like me. I felt very connected to them. I live in Philadelphia, the home of the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence, those symbols of American democracy. And I see in the Syrian people, even after 10 years of atrocities, I see in them that spirit, that, that wish for democracy that defines America. I see them as an extension of our story, and our story and their story are interlaced people fighting for freedom and democracy. And children started it. We inspired those children. And those children should inspire us right back. That's not a complicated story to hold on to. Children fighting for freedom. Very tough to watch, but we owe it to those who put their lives on the line in Syria to look when we can and to try to understand the Caesar photos. We have a fabulous panel tonight. Um, all of us know each other, so this is a casual conversation for us and hope I, we can illuminate it for you. I want to start with Moaz because he is probably more responsible than anybody on this panel for bringing Caesar to the United States in that, in that blue hoodie that you see him in. It was an extraordinary moment in Congress. And so, Moaz, I want to ask you about Caesar. Who is he? Um, 
his bravery, um, and how does a man like that do what he does? Well, first of all, it's <clears throat> I've gotten to know these amazing people on the panel, but it is always very humbling to be able to, to sit next to Deborah Amos and Ambassador Rapp. Omar, who's the most inspirational person I know, and Kotaiba, who I couldn't think of a better representative of the Syrian people in, in the United States. And I really want to thank um, SOS Syria here, um, Seton Hall University, uh, Professor Gale, Professor Goldberg, and, and Professor Youssef, and everyone who made this happen, and, and Abby Twining, um, who's a social director for SETF, but also a senior here at Seton Hall, and, and she's the reason that we're all here today. And I want to thank all of you for taking time to listen to us. I know people could be going home, it's the end of the day, but I think this is a very important conversation. And just to quickly answer um, your question, Deb, I think what's extraordinary about Caesar is that he's just an ordinary man. He is someone that is a humble, non-political Syrian national who worked um, before the revolution began in Syria as part of the military police uh, of, the, of the Assad regime and its military apparatus. And before the revolution, his job was to go and take photographs of any accidents or incidents um, that happened under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense. So if there was a car wreck or a drowning, a suicide or a fire, he would go to the scene, take photos of the scene, submit that to the, uh, the justice system of the, of the military, um, kind of like CSI or something, you know, someone taking photos as part of a, a report. But when the revolution broke out with those children who rode on the walls of their school uh, and were tortured, the protests that came out after where bare chests were met with bullets and unlawful arrests, all those people that were killed for peacefully asking for the rights that we too often, I think, take for granted here in the United States, um, he was asked to go take pictures of instances of death that ha happened within the intelligence branches. And when he went to this military hospital that day, he perceived these people as the protesters and as civilians that were obviously executed or tortured. And quickly, Caesar wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted to get out um, and spoke to a friend of his who contacted a group within the opposition and the conversation began about, you know, trying to help someone get out. And the answer was, you know, you can get out, but would you stay? Because you're documenting on behalf of the state these war crimes. And the courageous and surprising answer of Caesar was yes. And so Caesar, for two and a half years, in Damascus alone, documented almost 55,000 photographs of men, women, children, elderly, Arabs and Kurds, Sunnis and Shiites, Christians and Muslims, the whole mosaic of the Syrian people, uh, tortured in these horrific ways. So a snapshot in both geography and time, uh, two and a half years in Damascus alone, this man every day took photos, took them off the computer, took them to his friend, uploaded them on another computer, and then when things got dangerous, uh, it was time for Caesar to get out. And again, under a really hectic operation, one where he was risking his life, he was able to get out of the country and now be in Western Europe, um, where he continues to advocate and, and became a very key witness to both prosecutions and political advocacy when he came to the United States and testified uh, in 2014 before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And then later on, in a more recent hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee testified once again in support of a bill called the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act, named in his honor that was passed in 2019. It's an ordinary man who, when you ask, you know, this is incredible what you've done, like, you know, how did you do what you did? He says, anyone else who would have been in my position, if they have a conscience, if they're a human being, would have done the same thing. And I think in a way that's the story of Syria. Ordinary people put in extraordinary positions and, and really have been the most inspirational and resilient people that I've ever met. So Caesar, it, it truly is an honor for me and I know everyone here has gotten to know him on the panel as well, is just an amazing human being like anyone else, but it's someone that decided to do something about an ever again moment that's unfolding in the world. And thanks to him, these photos are now for the world to see. Thanks to him, there are multiple court cases uh, for war crimes open across Europe and hopefully soon in the United States. And thanks to him, there's now legislation aiming at the protection of civilians in Syria. So Omar, you of anyone on this panel, I think, know about wrong time, wrong place. 
Um, you were 15 when you were arrested. It probably is the reason you were able to survive because you were so young and resilient. But talk to us a little bit. You, in a very strange way, were on the other side of Caesar without really understanding what his role was till, till much later. Can you tell us what your job was and, and how you relate to Caesar? We all experienced fear in different grades, but um, I experienced fear in a level where it changed the way you think, it changed the, the, your brain. Um, I became not me during my time in prison, and I had responsibilities that I never thought I could, I could handle. Um, I was 15 years old, I grew up in a, in a small town, a beautiful town on the Syrian coast that we have the sea, we have the mountains, the rivers, and I was very interested in birds. So I could whistle in multiple ways and I could tame birds and I had this funny, simple, nice life and in the, from, the, from nowhere the war started in 2011 and the intelligence services attacked a protest. I was participating and I was not in the protest because I believed in the need of democratic change or whatever democracy or freedom. I had no idea about dictatorship. I joined the protest because that was a lot of young people. And when you go, when you go to back to school tomorrow, you have something fun to tell, right? You want to impress the ladies, you got to be in a demonstration that's dangerous, right? And I, I had no real understanding of anything. And they attacked and they took me to prison. When they attacked, I froze in my place because I never seen the police killing someone. I had this basic understanding of the police protecting the people. Because that's what you read in the books. That's what you see in the movies, right? My father himself was an officer before 2009. So he protected me all the time. That was my understanding of police. So when they attacked, I was in my place. When they start shooting people, I froze, started to shake until they came, arrested me, took me to prison, and tortured me for the first time. I felt like real pain when they pull out your fingernails. It hurts a lot. During my time in prison, I, I saw people dying for the first time. It was my first time seeing them. And I, I saw my, my closest friends dying with me in prison. During my last time in prison, I was requested, forced by the guard to go to the, what we used to call the dead room or the isolation room where you have all the dead bodies. In a prison where I spent one year, nine months, branch 215. I was chosen to go to this room where we have to carry all the dead bodies from every room in the prison to take them to the isolation room and there there will be a nurse who is also a prisoner and me who will be taking care of the bodies and we will be numbering them and then later we will carry them to the first floor where there is a car waiting for us where we will be throw the bodies in the car and they will be taken away. We had no idea where the bodies were taken away, right? And every person in the first time I joined this isolation room, every person was a human with a story. I would see this person as a child, or I would see this person as a father, as a brother, as a friend I had. Over time, that disappears, because you need to survive, right? You cannot think about it in the, in the same painful way you start thinking about it, just like people dying and that hurts. You just your head does not work that way anymore and these people are dying and you're just numbering them like you're doing a daily activity because the guard wants to kill our humanity during our time in prison. I saw thousands of people dying. Among them are my cousins and my friends who died with me in prison next to me or in my arms while I was carrying them. They died. And I cannot go back in time. They became numbers. And here comes our responsibility after surviving. We should remember and work hard to not just let them be numbers because they are much more than that. And that's the reason we had this exhibition. That's the reason we are here, to tell their stories, to remind the world that there are people who sacrificed 
willingly or unwillingly, they die. They sacrifice their life to give us a chance to survive, to give us a chance to have a freedom and democracy in the future. And that's why we should keep this exhibition traveling around the world in any country we can access, in any school, no matter if we have 5,000 people in the audience or if we have 10 people or one person, because we do not know who is the person in the audience who will be making this huge change that will change the, the situation in Syria, because we trust every single individual we meet and we talk to. Ambassador Rapp, um, I want to ask you to speak to two issues, um, and I've heard you many times talking about the Caesar photos in historical context. But I wonder if you can also talk about Syria's torture regime and the historical context of that. It was massive, it was state level, and for some, it doesn't make any sense what they were doing. Um, there was no information extracted from people, it was torture for torture. So if you can start with, how the Caesar photos historically uh, resonate, and, and two, if you can speak to what, this, what, what was that about? Well, on the historical sense, uh, we've had other mass atrocities in, in history, and, and uh, at Nuremberg we had enormous proof of what the Nazis had done, of the, of, of, of the plan for the final solution, but uh, uh, we didn't have uh, pictures of individual victims identified, there were sometimes pictures taken of great heaps of bodies, et cetera. Uh, but uh, in, in this context, the Caesar actually shows us human beings who were, who were, who were tortured to death in, in that system. And, and on them is identifying information, and by the fact the picture was taken on a certain day, and, and the body is, is, is not yet decomposed, you can figure out the person died a day or two beforehand, so you know when. Uh, you can see the facility, the 215, uh, the place where, frankly, uh, some 40% of the photos in the Caesar files, more than 5,000 of the victims of the 11,000, are actually from that unit where, where, uh, where Omar was for, for 19 months. But you, <laughs> they're actually writing the place in which they tortured to death, and they're bringing them in a military vehicle to the military hospital. And then, uh, and then uh, Caesar and his team has an order from a military magistrate to take photos of each of these uh, uh, bodies, uh, four or five photos of each, and, and put them in a file and, and, and send the file on for processing. Of course, the file is, is on for non-processing. But the, 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 the formula here, which is hard to imagine a government doing that, but it's their sort of standard operating procedure to make sure that what they've ordered is, is actually uh, been done. And, and in their uh, illegal I illegality, it also, uh, you know, if we go to Latin America, to Guatemala, you can go to 300 places where there are uh, mass graves at military installations during the genocidal campaign against the Maya in the 1980s. And those people were illegally buried. So they found them under the foundation, they find them under the barracks. Here they didn't bury them at 215. They sent them to the military hospital. Oh, the case is being investigated. And then there was this, this sort of phony investigation, at which point, as we've heard in the Koblenz case, uh, then the bodies are loaded into refrigerator trucks and taken to, to mass graves. Uh, a witness uh, in, in that trial, and we'll talk about that trial in a moment, in Germany uh, was, was burying the Caesar uh, victims. Caesar defected in August of 2013, but he continued every day to take, to, to receive bodies and, and to dig in, in an area that, uh, uh, that, that stretches across uh, an area three miles square, really, to, uh, to bury bodies by the thousands from these prisons that continued to be ground to death uh, long after Caesar left. This fellow didn't leave until early 2018. He also got the people from Sidnaya, which is where Omar was scheduled to be killed. Because in Sidnaya, you don't get tortured to death. I mean, you may die of torture, but they you know, execute people and hang them after one minute trials. And he described the difference between the corpses, because in one case, there were corpses like these, you know, horrible examples of emaciation and, and wounds and, 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 and cuts on their bodies and burns and, and everything else. Uh, the the Sidnaya victims were people that had been killed by, by a noose. 
and, and obviously we're in a different in a different state. So these we, we've got an immense amount of proof of this of this machinery of death. Well, uh, what was it all about? It was about the fact. I mean, you saw the, in, in in the film that at a particular point, uh, Syrians dared to dream that they could have a normal country. And, and you see these demonstrators out there with those flags, et cetera, and they're saying peaceful, peaceful, peaceful in, in, in Arabic. And they're dancing, you know, et cetera, and hoping that their country is going to be different. Well, that's something the regime just could not live with. And there were uh, tens of thousands of people involved in that. So as far as the regime was concerned, Every one of those people, but not just those people, anybody who was close to them, anybody who was in the same neighborhoods as them, and a lot of other people that had nothing to do with it, were swept up in order to be crushed and just to be ground down. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we talk often about this as a war. Uh, it is important to note that when this began in March of, of, of 2011, it was not a war. It was, it was an uprising. It became a war later uh, when... Uh, when obviously the regime wasn't changing and the Free Syrian Army and others, uh, the more moderate armed opposition formed and fought. And then, of course, obviously we had uh, uh, jihadist groups, uh, the most extreme being ISIS, that were involved as well, though I think, as, as I think we saw in the film, uh, some of what was done uh, by the regime was actually to aid them in a few places in order that they could present themselves as the, as the enemy, as, as those folks are the enemy. We're protecting you from, from the jihadists. But it, it then certainly, and for the last nine and a half years, has, has been a war. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, you know, the people ask me all the time as a lawyer, isn't this against the law? <laughs> isn't there something we can do? And, uh, you know, I, uh, in, you heard about me being an ambassador at large for, for six years in the Obama administration for global justice. The reason I was called to, to do that and got that job was I'd been an, a national prosecutor prosecuting organized crime, wire fraud, bank fraud, you know, environmental crime. Not always easy, but you've got the means and the tools <laughs> and a system that can build those cases and protect the witnesses and develop the evidence. And sometimes you don't win the case, maybe you shouldn't win the case, but you know, you have to, you're, you're, those, those cases are tested. Uh, in 2001, I went out to the international level to the Rwanda Tribunal that had been established by the General Assembly, by the Security Council. Russia, China, they supported that. 800,000 people had been murdered in 100 days. And so I prosecuted the leaders who were responsible for the Rwanda genocide. After six years there, I went over to West Africa and was appointed the chief prosecutor of a court that was called into being by both the country and the UN Security Council as a partnership. But it was the country itself that had gone through the war and it wanted justice, but it wasn't, it didn't have the capacity to deliver it in a fair and a proper way. So they asked for international partnership and a, and, and a mixed court. People say, why don't we have that in the case of Syria? Well, Security Council's blocked. <laughs> Russia vetoes positively everything, any criticism, any sanction. I mean, there are sanctions and, that exist against situations that are one-tenth as Syria, as, as, as Syria. But when it comes to Syria, Russia will veto. And in the Security Council, you know, you have 15 members, five of them are permanent, including us, Russia, and China, and, and Britain, and France. If any one of the five says no, boom, it's, it loses. So, when we tried to get it to an international court in, in, 19, in 2014, the vote was 13 yes to no. The two were China and Russia, and that was, and that, was that. And, and of course, they don't want it in, in, in uh, Assad doesn't want to be tried. He's not gonna call for a court to try the people responsible for the crimes that were committed in the country. So uh, how, do, how do we deal with that? And, and so we're left with these situations of trying to get cases into trial in, in third countries. And, and sometimes that's possible because of the law that's been established at these tribunals and through international conventions. Some crimes are so serious that you can prosecute them anywhere. Now, most states don't take advantage of that and write laws, we don't in the U.S., to allow us to prosecute all the crimes that we could legally prosecute under international law. And some states uh, don't provide much investigation for that kind of thing. Germany, fortunately, France, Sweden, some others are actually stepping up. And, and appropriately, because of course, they've also accepted, particularly Germany and, and Sweden, an enormous number of, of, of refugees who, who didn't come to 
<laughs> who didn't leave hearth and home and abandon their, their, uh, everything that they built and their extended families because they wanted you know, a bigger pay packet or something. Uh, they came because they were being targeted because their children were being picked up on deliveries uh, in, in their businesses uh, because of where they were born or something, and, and they can't, couldn't live. Or they were being bombed with barrel bombs and, 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 and poison gas. Or if they went to get medical treatment, the, the hospital was getting bombed uh, uh, and the doctors were in, uh, much more likely to get killed than, a, than an ISIS fighter by the regime. So, you know, that's the world they were living in. That's why they went by the tens of thousands, uh, as, as Omar did, uh, in, in, into Europe. And, and it's appropriate, I think, the European courts use their jurisdiction, but it, it depends on the, on the situation. Uh, in many countries like ours, you have to have either the perpetrator present or you have to have a citizen who's a victim. Germany doesn't necessarily require that. Uh, though, of course, if you're actually going to prosecute somebody, you're going to have to have a way to get a hold of the, of, of, of the perpetrator. Uh, but at least uh, because of that, we're seeing some, some something of justice, and, and we've got this important case in Germany and, and several others that are coming, and as, as Moaz said, we hope uh, uh, at least uh, uh, cases in the U.S. where there were U.S. nationals who were tortured and murdered, in fact, uh, and, and there's U.S. jurisdiction, and so we hope that eventually there are prosecutions here, at least arrest warrants, if, uh, though of course the perpetrators may be protected in Syria or Russia, and so it may be very hard to arrest them, but at least the the, the, the indictment will be out there and the signal will be sent to those guys that uh, they better watch out where they go or they're going to be collared uh, for the rest of their lives. And yet, and yet, Oteva, Caesar has been in Congress. That was shocking the first time it happened. His pictures were at the Holocaust Museum and that was striking when it happened. But not only does it appear that Assad has won the war, but there are countries talking about normalization. Um, the Syrian regime is now back in Interpol, um, which is also striking. Um, so how do you think about, what, how, what do you say to yourself about has Assad won the war? Um, and is there more fight to go? Sure. Thank you, Ambassador Rob. Um, thank you, Deborah. Um, thanks to the Syrian Emergency Task Force, their amazing team for all the work. I was honored throughout the years to participate in events, projects with them. Um, but also thanks to you all, um, organizers and attendees. Um, you know, 10 years after doing this, you would imagine that we get used to it. Um, but it's actually never easy to get used to it. We are you know, seeing he, he, sitting here, and it's not only you, you know, bearing witness what we say. Um, it's also those folks. It's uh, Rihab Allawi from their Zor. It's uh, Qutayba Shaykhani, uh, Mahmoud Inyazi. It's uh, Mazen Zakaria from Damascus. Um, and it's thousands <laughs> more that we don't know their names because um, their families were not able to identify them. Um, and those souls, those people continue to bear witness what we are doing um, to see if they will actually get the justice they deserve. Um, I'll start from where, you know, Ambassador Rapp um, ended. It's really interesting looking at this regime and, and where we are today. Um, historically, we know very few probably about how the regime got to where um, it is today, to where, you know, it has been for the last 60 years. But we know, you know, um, small anecdotes um, about this regime. We know that in the early 60s, um, um, a former Nazi officers, officer, one of the founders of the SS battalion that was uh, um, assigned to protect the officers of the, uh, the high ranking officers of the Nazis, <laughs> he left Germany, he went to Egypt, and he um, eventually ended up in Syria. We know he was assigned, um, after the Ba'ath Party took power, we know he was assigned like a high-ranking mission. He was one of the highest advisors to the government at the time. But we don't know what that assignment was exactly. But at the same time, we know that this, what the regime has been doing for 60 years, more intensely in the past 10 years, is not chaotic. We know it is systematic. We know that the regime writes those names on the forehead 
and document with photo each single body because that's how they're used to do it, because this is how the system tells them to do it. We know my own father was detained eight times between 1965 and 1980. Um, what he witnessed, what I witnessed, was not just some chaotic um, violence. I was detained at a time where the regime was more kind of like following its system, where um, if you, when you get in, a doctor would examine your body and would decide which level of torture they would start with because the regime was so efficient, they didn't want to waste time using tools um, that they're not, would not be very effective depending on how much your body can handle. This is what we know about the regime. This is the experience we know the regime built throughout this year, whether it is through Alois Brunner um, or other officers who helped it um, be where it is today. Um, moving from that to where we are today, um, <coughs> it is, to be completely honest, absolutely shameful where, where we are. The, today, we, what we see is fatigue from the international community, from the United States, um, about pursuing justice, about going after the Syrian regime. Um, we hear statements as, we tried everything. Um, we, we tried everything, but we failed. Assad is actually staying, um, and we cannot do anything about it. And Assad is actually, might be staying for a little bit more, um, but not because he is strong, not because um, that he was actually able to win the war. The fact is, you know, Iran and Russia stepped in, the regime itself, the state institutions are almost non-existent. The regime army that was 400,000 um, soldiers before the war, it's close to nine or 10,000 10, soldiers today and the rest are Iranians, Afghanis, and Russian mercenaries. If we look at those facts, we look at, you know, have the country being displaced, we look at over one million Syrians being killed in the last 10 years, um, we look where the economy is, it would take, you know, close to $2 trillion to actually get the country um, back to where it was. No one actually won the war, not even Assad. But what happened is that we actually failed to hold Assad accountable. Assad is still there, not because he is strong, but because our leadership in the international community did not have the guts, did not have the courage to actually stand for what is right in Syria. And this is not a, you know, democratic vs. Republican. Unfortunately, failure to actually uphold justice, international justice, is a bipartisan issue, um, you know, in our country. Both Democrats and Republicans, we have failed to actually hold Assad to the standards um, that we should have. Uh, we, we actually set um, post-World War II after we defeated the Nazis. And the problem with that today is, not, is that we are not normalizing Assad as a person. We're normalizing the behavior that the Assad regime did in the last 10 years. We're normalizing killing civilians in the hundreds of thousands. We're normalizing displacing millions. In Syria, there are 13 million people who are displaced, over 50% of the country. We're normalizing actually keeping, we have over 2 million children who are outside, who have been outside school since the beginning of the uprising. Um, we're normalizing the torture and killing of hundreds of thousands of people, including those in the pictures behind me, and thousands more, if not tens of thousands more, we don't know about. This is what we are normalizing. For me, I mean, it doesn't matter whether, you know, now Assad stays or not. What matters of, you know, the people who are being prosecuted, the people who are going to be prosecuted in the future, but not only in Syria. Because what the Assad regime did is that it created a model, an example of what could be successful. Other regimes, you know, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, the Mubarak regime, the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia, uh, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia, they thought, you know what, we can't really do much against popular uprisings, you know, half the country is on the streets, we really need to leave. Um, maybe Gaddafi, you know, took a different model, but he also felt like, hey, we need to negotiate with the people. Assad proved them all wrong, but didn't only prove those in the past, he proved to those in the future that you can kill your own people, you can displace half of your country, 
you can bring your country to the ground and still you can stay in power. And what I worry about, you know, with normalizing the Assad regime is not only the fate of, you know, Syrians who are seeing being, being held, the fate of, you know, my generation, the future generation is in Syria. Um, the hopes we had, whether I remember the um, President Obama, um, Cairo, uh, University of Cairo speech, um, for someone in the Middle East, for someone who is very aware of what's happening, very worried at that age of, you know, the relationship between the East and, uh, East and West. Um, I, I mean, I got a lot of hope from, from his speech at the time. I thought that, you know, for once maybe we can just open a new page between the United States, between the American people and people in the Middle East and forget about everything else. Forget about, you know, the, even the Iraq war, the, like, you know, all the issues that, you know, we thought the United States stood on the wrong kind of like side. We were, I, my generation was willing to forget that and move on. Um, I worry that the next generation is not willing to move on. And when they see, when they are faced with, with the opportunities, either Assad or extremism, either Assad or poverty, either Assad or something else, people are fed up of choo you know, having to choose the dictator every time, whether it is Assad in Syria or anyone else in, those, in other of those countries. This is the, um, the model that we're moving towards. With our leadership, again, the problem is they feel, the feeling that we have tried everything, this is absolutely wrong. Um, and again, with whether this is Republican or Democrats, it's not that we have tried everything. We have actually failed to try what is right to be done. Because, and again, this is you know, probably a good exercise for us. Maybe this is the democracy paradox. Um, Moaz, you know, Ambassador Rapp, of course, and you know, Omar and I, we've met with you know, many US officials. And what I hear all the time is that, you know, we are elected for this four years in office. Um, it doesn't matter what happens after. Um, so a lot of politicians today think this way. But you know who it matters for after four years, after those officials leave? It matters for you. It matters for your families. Um, it matters for, like, those who would, you know, for your neighbors, your children, for those of you who are married. This is who it's gonna ma matter for, because you are staying there. Those officials might feel, you know, I'm not gonna be judged after I leave office. It's the problem of whoever is gonna come after. But it is our responsibility to hold those officials accountable, because they're not protecting our present or our future. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to, to come and ask a question, and I'm gonna do one more round of accountability and as you wish, come and ask questions. And I'm gonna start with you, Moaz. You know, Ambassador Rep um, began to talk about what's happening in Europe, and these trials are interesting. They haven't resonated yet with an American audience, but as the movement builds, it's likely they will, because there will be some um, resolution uh, this year and more trials next. Does it matter? Uh, will there be resonance in the United States for these uh, verdicts, and does it, ch does it change anything? I think it does matter. <clears throat> it does matter what happens in Europe, and it does matter what people here sort of learn about. Because one thing that I've noticed, whether when Caesar came uh, and we were doing the, the hearing in 2014, we chose 100 photos from the Caesar file, and a couple of staff members, Republican and Democrat, um, made sure that they sat down with as many members as possible, and it was tens of members, and, and just flipped through all the photos, like made them sit through all the photos. And I can tell you that there were members that were to the far right and to the far left, ones that were isolationists, ones that may have had bigoted ideas about who lives in the Middle East, ones that, you know, would have never, you know, even wanted to talk about Syria. After seeing those uh, photographs, they all were, some were moved to tears, others were just, you know, recollecting what they learned in college and stuff about, you know, past uh, horrible massacres. And, and seeing that was, was powerful. I also remember that when that chemical weapons attack happened, 
in 2013 after the red line statement, all the major news outlets, because it was assumed we were going to act because we said we would, um, were playing videos of, of, of the chemical weapons strike. And at that time, a poll came out that showed 65% um, of, the, of, of the public were for doing something about this. There needs to be action about it. The reason I mention those things is because I disagree with the idea that the American people are hardwired to, to think, you know, any U.S. intervention in any way, military or not outside, is not good. Uh, I, I think that, that American people aren't wary of doing the right thing in the world. I think when they see injustice, Americans are humanitarians. They want to do the right thing, whether that is accountability and just as important, if not more, ending the killing that's unfolding um, that will need more prosecution in the future. So I think as these trials go on in Europe, I hope that they set a precedent and they're at least a reminder when they pop up on the news to what, first of all, is happening in Syria and what our job should be is to also show that that if we don't think that, you know, the people that are dying there and, and that are being tortured to death, you know, if we don't care about the humanitarian aspect of that, that when we allow something so horrific to unfold with complete impunity, that on a long enough time scale, it becomes a national security issue for us here and for Europe and so on. I mean, I look at Brexit, I look at the rise of extreme right-wing parties in Europe, I look at um, other things that have happened outside that were really indirect results of what was going on in Syria. Um, and so whether we see it or not, Sometimes it's not just the right thing to do, get accountability and the killing. It also matches with our national strategic interests. But finally, I want to remind everyone here and anyone that watches the live stream uh, and, and something that hopefully as we work on as an organization with the efforts of Ambassador Rapp uh, can, can get more prominence and with your amazing coverage, um, that there are Americans that were in these horrific locations. There are Americans that were executed after a fake show two-minute trial. There are Americans that were horrifically tortured. Some survived and some did not. Um, and, and based on that, I think there are openings for potential criminal and civil prosecutions here in the United States, uh, ones that we are, um, I, you know, we're, we're very hopeful and optimistic will, will take place. Um, and although I can't describe one of the Americans, for example, uh, in this, because as we go through this, this sort of phase, some of the stuff isn't public, I do want, if you give me a chance, just to give like a two-second story of, of Rehab, because her name was mentioned a few times. And I think it's also good not just to learn their names, but learn some of their stories. This was a civil engineering student, an architect, who's, who's, the reason she got arrested is she was giving internally displaced civilians medicine and baby formula. That is way worse than holding an AK-47 and shooting in Syria. That's who they target, not collateral damage on hospitals. They target hospitals. So when she was arrested, um, she didn't think that what she did was bad enough for her to be murdered for it. And so she, we talked to her cellmate, who we still you know, meet with and talk to, an amazing also former detainee who has an inspirational story of her own. Her summit described how she would use anything she can to, dra to, to sketch how she would rebuild the bridges in the buildings that have been bombed to smithereens by the Russians in the, era, by, in the Assad regime and its allies. Um, and of course, she never got to go out and do that. Um, she ended up being a photograph. But I think knowing her story is a reminder that even though we have Americans there, these Syrians are just like us. In, in Syria, we were never used to war. We never thought it would happen. And I think that's another reminder that these things can happen in places where you don't expect it. And that's why we need to be conscious of, of that internationally so we can also learn lessons for here at home. Omar, you could have been one of those photographs. Um, international uh, accountability is, is tricky. You were tortured in a place that there's no trial yet because it takes a long time to make a trial. Um, when you watch the trial in Germany, the one from 251, does that give you a release? Um, or are you waiting for your trial, for your particular branch? I think it, it gives me a very empowering feeling to see a person who was responsible for torture and death and places where 
where, where I was. It gives me some empowering because, because, you know, I can't tell my mom, like, one of those who done that to me is in jail. That means somebody else could be, right? If we can't get one, we can't get ten, right? And that, that, so that's a perfectly good start. And I don't always think about it from a personal personal aspect. I think about it about the case in, in general because even though these guards who tortured me, they tortured me for a long time and I'm supposed to hate them the most, I never seen them. I was not allowed to see them, right? So all guards in general who was responsible for torture, they all as, as guilty and as I want them to be, to be prosecuted because I want to give this mother that lost her child some some hope and trust in the future because if her just be, kid became just a kid just a just, just a photo just a number she wouldn't trust the humanity anymore right she won't trust you anymore she won't trust me anymore if i don't fight for that because those who survived survived because the others died i survived because the other prisoners decided to give me their food so I can live. Because my cousin Bashir in prison thought I have a potential better future than him. So he would sacrifice him, him, his life for me. And I get out of prison, I do nothing about it. Just enjoy my new life, go to Georgetown and fall in love and go back to Halloween party. I should do all of that, by the way. But at the same time, I should dedicate some of my time to care about those who once cared about me. And the first, accountability is not just being in court. Accountability started since I was in prison. When the Caesar photos came out, surprisingly, I knew nothing. Whatever photos came out, I knew nothing about outside. And when you're in prison, being tortured every day in so much fear and pain and starving to the level where people are killing each other. The father is killing his son to eat because they starved over so many years. Your biggest dream is to eat once, be full, and die because you don't even remember that feeling from before prison. And suddenly, they brought us a lot of food and they stopped torturing us for one day. You get really alarmed. That's scary. Why did they do this? You don't eat. Second day, we got more food. Third day, we got more food, afraid. But then we started to eat because we felt like we, ha we have it now. So we eat. That, ha that happened like, through th a few weeks, and I, I felt like I was living the dream. <laughs> You know, being in prison, less torture, and getting the food, that was my dream for, for, for the first year in prison. And I came out of prison, and I tried to go back on media to check what happened at that month when I get the food. Because after that month, they get back to torturing us, to starving us again. What happened? I checked back in time, and that was when the Caesar photos were made public. When they were met public, everybody was talking about them. All media or activi you know, activists, social media accounts, everybody. That's the first step of accountability because the guard was afraid. They will be held accountable. They were afraid the regime will fall because we all were watching. The problem today is that we are not watching because it's been happening for 10 years, and you move on. Now it's Afghanistan, and tomorrow is a different country. So we move on to the new news. And what's in news, it's defined by the, these media agencies. Syria is not news anymore. Torturing people is not news anymore. It's been happening for so long time, so they don't talk about it anymore. So we're not watching. And those guards in prison are thriving. Because they know, oh, okay, nobody's talking about this anymore. We can torture how many people we want. We can kill how many people we want. So accountability does not start in the court. It starts when we speak up. Then the court is a very important result of our work. It's important to deliver this message to the guards 
who are still there in prison, torturing other prisoners. At this time, right now, while we're talking right now, there are people being tortured. Right now. These guards, nobody is thinking about it. So they will do it more and more and more and more and more. When we deliver the message, one of you guys is now here in Germany or in the U.S. captured and held accountable for their crimes, they will think about their future because a guard is like anyone that want to have a better future for themselves, for their wives, for, for, their, fu for their kids, right? So they will get afraid and they will think twice before doing it. They will think about a way out. And when they are out, we can use them as witnesses, but also we can prosecute them. Ambassador Rapp, is what's happening in Europe a movement in the courts? And what will it look like in six months? Well, it is a movement. Uh, but let's, first of all, uh, give credit where credit is due. I mean, we've had cases in third countries before. I mean, when I was at the Rwanda Tribunal, we were sending information to third countries that had Rwandan refugees who were believed not to be valid refugees. They were not victims, they were victimizers. And so we were building the cases, and, uh, and some of those individuals have been convicted in 12 or 13 different countries. And so that happened, though generally 15, 20, 25 years uh, after the crime. Uh, what's remarkable here is that these, and, and, and in a case of a country, uh, where the, the victims group actually won the war because there was a civil war and they, uh, the, the perpetrators uh, lost the war but won the genocide, essentially, and were forced out and went all over the world to escape and, and have been arrested. Uh, but there was real consequences uh, to that uh, event, uh, because there was uh, uh, assistance of that government. And you could go there, you could talk to witnesses, you could put them, bring them to your country, you could put them on video, you could find the sites, etc. Here in Syria, we don't have that. We have a regime that's hostile to it. We've had UN inquiries uh, since the Human Rights Council established one ten and a half years ago. They write a big report every six months about all the horrors that have happened during the previous six months. It doesn't get much of a headline anymore. Uh, but you know, they're, they're able to continue these crimes. Uh, but it's been because of Caesar bringing out this fantastic evidence, uh, because of the fact that uh, civil society groups and others working with international NGOs brought out an immense amount of evidence. Uh, I mean, I'm the chair of this, this NGO called CJA, which uh, at the time we were, the bio was written, you know, had 750,000 pages of regime documents, now has 1.3 million pages of, of regime documents, which are the orders. This whole thing that we just talked about was a plan. <laughs> And, and who was going to be arrested, and, and uh, the whole business of the machinery of death, and, and the knowledge of what was happening uh, is in those documents meticulously. So we see that system operating to do it. So because of that, uh, prosecutors in third countries, who usually are at a real disadvantage because they don't have the budgets to fly around the world <laughs> and, to, and to go interview people in third countries, et cetera, they don't have the language, they don't know the culture, uh, they can't tell what a good witness is compared to another one without, uh, without some staff and people from those countries, have had the benefit of the civil society uh, working with the prosecutors and often bringing these cases forward in, in European countries that particularly allow for, for victims, as, as Omar has in Sweden, uh, to bring cases forward to the prosecutor and in some cases actually to become the prosecutor and to have the judge take up the case even when the public prosecutor doesn't. So that's, I think, been the, the, the really remarkable thing here. And that's led to a revolution where we have similar things being done in, in Myanmar, and Tigray, and in other situations, South Sudan, uh, around the world, uh, where we uh, people who see what's happening elsewhere, and, and, and sadly, as, as, as uh, Kateba said, uh, uh, other dictators are getting the lesson you can kill your way out of it. These norms are being trashed. But at the same time, people know that justice is possible. And, and so we are seeing, I think, a greater willingness of countries to step up and, and, uh, and to prosecute these, these, these cases. Uh, you know, in my view, it's not enough. 
Uh, you know, and, and it, it often ends up finding relatively low-level people. It's not done in the kind of strategic way that we did Nuremberg, taking the big guys, you know, and then the, ne the next tier. Uh, it's, uh, it's not even done between countries, and sometimes countries aren't going after the worst guy that's actually located there. It's, it's just a person who they managed to get some information on and decided to make a case out of. So I think there's a lot more that can be done to, to strengthen uh, this approach, but uh, this is happening, and it will continue to happen. And and even while you know Assad can talk about, or you know he can get visits uh, from uh, the UAE and and uh, and get on the phone to the King of Jordan and and uh, and get uh, uh, into the into the structure of of of, um, of Interpol. But we can talk about that further because there are ways I think that that we may be able to protect uh, something. Uh, uh, in terms of him putting out bad arrest warrants, but just the very idea that he's in there in a rule of law institution when he represents exactly the opposite, it's an outrage. Uh, but I think we're, we, we are building something that, that does have some, some real durability here, and, and we, it, it needs to, we need to find different ways for different countries uh, to participate in it. I mean, I'd like to see countries pool their jurisdiction and form a joint court so they could do the cases more effectively. And, and one of the things, by the way, people keep saying, when's Assad going to face justice? Well, there's a little problem with prosecuting in a third country. One country can't prosecute the leader of another. Only an international court or a group of countries putting a court together can do that. <laughs> so this is one of the re this is part of my, my, my current dream that I'm lobbying for. It's, 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 it's challenging. At the meantime, on the other hand, there, there's a lot of very serious offenders that I'd like to see, to see, to see arrested uh, uh, short of him. But we need to send that signal. And, uh, you know, I reminded of the, the whole German experience, of course, Nuremberg, later, 20 years later, in Germany, a transition, and they began to prosecute some of their own for the, the, the death camps. And, and now you see, uh, um, I mean, and some these are controversial, I know, uh, these cases recently with uh, two Saxon house and uh, camp guards in the death camp, uh, one 100 years old, uh, convicted in, in, a, in a German court. Not, not a long sentence, there's not much time left to live. Maybe an arrest home. But, but the fundamental message there is there is no escaping justice for these crimes. That you can be a guard at 25 and, and, and 70 years from now, you know, somebody's going to knock on your door <laughs> and collar you and take you to court. That's the message we really want to, to be out there. And, and I think whatever happens in terms of the negotiations, uh, and I don't think Assad's won. I mean, it's still Idlib, still Turkish forces there. There's still the Kurdish situation, the variety of things. But, but uh, and maybe he, you know, there's some kind of peace where he doesn't have to have any kind of truth, any kind of accountability. I mean, that's just unthinkable. He can just keep imprisoning people. Maybe that happens. And maybe some people will say that's a peace. Uh, but there'll still be these cases. People will still face prosecution. There'll still be justice. You, you, this means you can't sweep it under the rug, because uh, it will be there. Oteba, you have the last words, and they will have to be short, because we're running out of time. But what I wanted to ask you about is the battle of the narrative, which seems to me is where we are now. Um, you see it more in Europe than you see it here. You know, there are British academics who say that, you know, chemical weapons attacks didn't happen or the rebels did it, the Russian trolls who, if you do a podcast for the BBC about the white helmets, they will, they will come after you before you even broadcast. You know, this is yeah. the battle of the narrative and I think it becomes even more crucial as we come to, to a verdict in the, the current trial that the Assads realized that they could be charged with crimes against humanity and so they've been threatening witnesses. How do you deal with the battle of the narrative? How do you make sure that your truth is louder than, than theirs? I think as we, we build on what you questioned last, it's all about hope. Um, I think maintaining hope and you know, setting out our goals strategically um, knowing that it will take time is the thing that actually pushes us to continue repeating the message. Because the time you actually lose hope and you say like, you know, it's done, you know, we can't really change this, that is the moment when actually Assad win. That's the moment when any criminal like Assad would win. Because they are just 
banking on the idea that, you know, we're just gonna wait until you lose hope and that's when we're gonna come back. So, I mean, for us in the opposition or for like, you know, people like Omar, Muaz, or Ambassador Rapp, I think the idea that, you know, we are waking up every morning, um, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror and we know, you know, there are, whether it is faces like Rihab, Qutayba, Mahmoud, and Mazen waiting for us to bring them justice, or actually the faces of, you know, the children of the Wisdom House. Um, the orphans were actually waiting in camps and other places, and they're waiting for us to actually build a sense of future for them. Knowing that and, you know, making sure that we are here at Seton Hall, we are, you know, in Washington, you know, showing our faces to members in Congress, to um, officials in the administration at the White House or State Department, is what's, you know, making the job of Assad and his allies in Russia and elsewhere very hard because, you know, they realize it's hard to get their messages through as long as we have this hope as, and as long as we are moving forward. And what actually would make our job easier um, is actually your help. Um, we live at it in a time today where, you know, we've seen the last, and I'm, I'm sorry for getting maybe a little bit political here, we've seen the last couple of elections and, and how close results are, you know, are. Um, and actually I wanna ask by raise of hand, who here can vote and do vote? Do you guys all vote? You know how you can actually make our job easier? Is when you actually show up at rallies or write to your representative and tell them, I do care about Syria. Tell me what you are doing to make Assad, to hold Assad accountable so I can give you my vote. That's when you can actually push those leaders in Congress and elsewhere to actually do what they should be doing, to have the courage to let go of their cowardness and do what is right to stop what is happening, not only for Syrians, but also for us here in the United States. Because when those officials think, you know, I'm only here for, here for those two and four years, it doesn't matter, they're not gonna do anything. And it's gonna be our problem, if not five years from now, it is 10 years from now. We've seen it once, you know, in 2001, we've seen it when ISIS rose up, we've seen it with the rise of the right wing in Europe when the refugee um, waves went into, in 2016, with the refugee waves in 2016, and we'll see it again in so many different ways. And it's us who are actually paying the price, it's not them. But by showing up and putting our, vo our vote, on, our voice on the line, that's when we can actually make the biggest change. Make your vote actually matter, because it does, especially today. In next year, in, in, uh, in 2022, and in three years, in 2024. Shukran. Thank you. Um, that's a great place to stop. Um, it is very close to 8.30, and we promised that we would. Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming. I, I know that you didn't have any questions, so I'm assuming we answered them all, or <laughs> at least I hope we did. Uh, we tried our best. Um, I would like to thank uh, Moaz Mustafa, uh, Omar El Shogri, Ambassador Rapp, and Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Idlibi, I've always liked that last name. You can name. call me Q. <laughs> Q? <laughs> Just Q. <laughs> um, I like that you're named after the place where all the Syrians are. The, you know, <laughs> they're all there now. <laughs> and so this is good. So thank you all for being with us. Um, and that's the end. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I, I would like you to spend some time here trying to spend a moment with, uh, with, with Deb, with Moaz, with Rab, with Kuteba, with me. Talk to these people in person here. Just get connected to the, to the issue by knowing someone a little bit closely. Shake hand with these people. That would be wonderful if you Pharaoh, can do that. Pauline, Abby Twining, if you have any questions, go to syrianpassports.org. Uh, find us on Facebook and, and so on. But... And and download Gale, you've got Syria. amazing people at this university that can connect And download us. Syria Watch app. Oh yeah, download <laughs> Syria Watch. Do yeah. it. Syria Watch, Android and iPhone, it's free. Every time a civilian is attacked, you get a notification. It's just a reminder of what people are living under. Put yourself in their shoes. God bless you all. Thank you. One more really quickly. Um, so one thing I wasn't quite talked about were the letter, letters of hope. And this campaign has run by the SOTF team.